Hello everybody, it's Philly Cuss with another Hump Day Haul. We are up to number 80. You know, every week I get together with you guys on a Wednesday night and discuss my stack of overpriced new comic books. And uh, we got a big weekend coming up. Batman v Superman is coming out in the theaters. And I'm really excited about it. Uh, the movie so far, review-wise, a lot of critics are panning it, giving it some pretty mediocre reviews. So, I don't know. I guess we'll see. But I don't give a fuck what the reviewers say about it, man. They used to talk a lot of shit about Blade, and I ended up loving that series. So, I'm going to go into this uh, untainted... Uh, keep an open mind and uh, hope to have a good time. And if I do see that this weekend, maybe I'll throw up a review a la the way I threw up a review of the movie The Witch, which a lot of people didn't seem to like either. I did. And we'll talk about it. So I don't know if it was any coincidence by DC that opening week with Batman v Superman coming out, that Batman number 50 comes out. And yes, on the front cover... We have Bruce Wayne returning as Batman. It's all over the internet, so I don't think I'm spoiling anything. Uh, the last issue, there was some uncertainty whether or not the process to bring Batman, Bruce Wayne back as Batman would kill him. I guess it didn't. Uh, if anything, it's made Batman stronger. The Dionysium, I hope I said that right, that they use to rejuvenate Batman has rejuvenated his body, and Alfred reveals to us that you are the strongest Batman that there's ever been in existence. So his body is fully healed. All the injuries and whatnot are gone. And here's a glimpse of that new costume that Batman's in. Notice the yellow trim around the bat. Pretty interesting. Kind of has like looks of, I don't know, what, the animated series a little bit? I'm feeling it. Um, so this is... Number 10 of Super Heavy. This shit has been going on, I think, since June of, what, 2015, where Bruce Wayne was no longer Batman. He's been suffering from amnesia, and Commissioner Gordon has picked up the mantle of Batman in his mecha suit. Um, and it's, ex it's explored some very interesting themes. You know, does Batman need Bruce Wayne? Or does Bruce Wayne need Batman? You know, that's the whole thing. You know, Bruce Wayne's tortured existence. Would it be better if he wasn't Batman? Uh, it was interesting. Very interesting. You know, I guess my suspension of disbelief about Commissioner Gordon stepping up as Batman, even though he's in this mech suit, you know, was pretty tested. Um, you know, uh... I guess overall I enjoyed the story, and this is going to turn out to be a huge blockbuster issue. Um, it's the penultimate issue of the team of Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo. These guys have been working on this, I think, since like 2011. Uh, there's going to be one more issue after this where they work together, and then the whole rebirth thing, DC Rebirth, is going to happen, and it's going to be a whole new creative team, which I'm not sure who it is. I don't know if DC has announced who is going to be on this, but lots of stuff happening in here. It's uh, got to be a double issue, I would say, but they still bang us with a $6 price. You know, god damn it, DC doing what DC do, right? Every time, you know, when you suspect a big hot issue is going to come out, especially if it involves Batman or Superman, they're going to jack up the fucking price. Uh, at least with the Superman number 50, it only went up to four ninety nine. I don't know why with Batman it went up to five ninety nine. Maybe there's some extra pages or something. I don't know. But Duke Thomas, who uh, was star of the We Are Robin series, uh, there's allusions here. It's alluding that he may become the new Robin. But who knows what will happen? They're just, you know, they're rebooting the series again. So I don't know if any of this stuff is going to carry over or what. I guess we learned a little bit more about Mr. Bloom, you know, that giant, weird looking seed guy who has been infecting Gotham, the citizens of Gotham. 
with riotous results. I mean, Gotham is in pure shambles in this. Uh, he does battle against a repurposed Joker bot, which I don't, I don't get this at all. I don't know if Joker kind of hijacked the Mechabat suit and did that, maybe. I don't know. I'll, I'll be interested to see what happens. Uh, but I guess we'll see. I think in the Detective Comics at one point there was a giant bat uh, Joker robot, but I can't quite recall. So that's it, man. That's the last hurrah. I'm reading, too, as well, that there's going to be some great speeches in this book given by Commissioner Gordon. Commissioner Gordon as Batman is still going to be the main focal point in this. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what they have to say to each other. Uh, especially in issue number 51, where they're going to have, you know, some probably tough conversations with one another. And I think, I don't know, I kind of think that maybe it should be continued, you know. Have both of them maybe existing in one space, because I think that that could lead to some very interesting stories along the way. You know, that was a whole theme as well. You know, Bruce Wayne, Batman, Vigilante, as opposed to <clears throat> Commissioner Gordon, a Batman who is sanctioned by the Gotham Police Department. So, cool, cool dichotomies uh, that have been explored in this series, but I'm ready for Bruce Wayne to be back as Batman for sure. Okay, last week I missed Superman Wonder Woman number 27. Uh, I decided to get the poly bag variant cover. Uh, this continues, you know, the whole story with Vandal Savage. Uh, this issue, I believe, focuses on Vandal Savage's children um, doing battle with uh, Superman and Wonder Woman. So this will complete my whole story arc with Savage Dawn, and I'll finally be able to read. I'll read this first, and then I will be able to read Superman number 50, which I've been holding off on. All right, so here's the variant cover, man. It's all upside down and funny looking, but as you can see, Batman and Superman in an embrace there. So it'll be cool to see what happens between Superman and Wonder Woman versus Vandal Savage's children. And I'm sure that this has a ton of artists on it. The one thing about these Superman series is that it seems that they usually have four or five artists per issue on one. And it kind of, you know, disrupts the flow of the reading a bit. But lots of big page spreads here with Wonder Woman and Superman doing battle. So I had to have a completionist run on that series. And, uh, you know, I'm glad I got it. Okay, Harley Quinn, number 26. Check out how Harley looks, right? She kind of looks just like... The new hairstyle, that bomb pop hairstyle of uh, the upcoming Suicide Squad movie, right? So Harley has given herself a makeover here in this issue. She definitely dyed her hair. I don't know who's playing Harley Quinn in that upcoming movie. I don't know. I just don't know the names of actors and actresses anymore. There's just so many of them, right? Hollywood has changed so much. But if you notice her jacket... On the back it says owned, and that's the Joker all beat up, crying inside his cell at Arkham Asylum. Because if you read last issue, number 25, it was a huge issue for Harley Quinn, where for the first time in that series, uh, in the New 52, and post-New 52, Harley Quinn, that she confronted the Joker and finally said to him that, you know, you don't have any control over me. When I was younger, I made mistakes. I regret those mistakes. I regret ever being involved with you. You were an abusive asshole. Get the F out of my life. And they actually embraced in a kiss, and she, Harley Quinn style, bit his freaking lip off. Big hunk of his lip. I loved that, and I loved seeing Harley Quinn stand up to the Joker. And it was very symbolic, you know, that Harley Quinn really can stand on her own, too, and has become one of the most successful uh, franchises for DC. And, you know, the writers on here, Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palmletti, uh, I enjoy their work. You know, I look forward to Harley Quinn every month. I always laugh. It's always a good read. It's an entertaining read. 
Uh, here in this sequence, Harley confronts a sexual harasser. And I just wonder what an Ornita Sarkeesian would think of this, you know? She would probably say, yes, Harley Quinn is still very objectified, right? Scantily clad outfits, stuff like that. But I love Harley. Um, truly, uh, I'm torn between her or Spider-Woman as my favorite uh, female comic book hero. But hell, Spider-Woman might be my favorite comic book hero, period, uh, male or female. I just enjoy them that much. She's suffering some from some PTSD. She's having some interesting dream sequences. Look at that. Joker's still controlling her. So I like that they're still touching on that, you know, that there's still kind of an aftermath of that because it was a huge thing. Now, also, a new villain uh, appears in this, kind of uh, secretive. He's all wrapped up in bandages and such. And it'll be interesting to see who this cat is, all right? But I'm saying, if you haven't read Harley Quinn before, do yourself a favor and at least pick up issue number 25. I'm sure that they have uh, some issues left at your comic book shop, and it's definitely going to be a key issue down the line. You know, it just really, I felt, was a monumental issue for that series. So check it out. All right, I got a couple Star Wars books from Marvel. We got... Star Wars number 17, there we go, Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, not really looking like Luke Skywalker at all there, but anyway, riding in the Falcon, uh, half of this story is a buddy story with Luke and Han Solo, Han Solo has gambled away like 100,000 credits or something that they were supposed to put towards supplies, Han Solo and Luke Skywalker got to get out of the shit, man, that's involved with that. How are they going to get the money back? So classic Star Wars stuff there, them being chased and whatnot. No big whoop. But the other half of this story is Princess Leia and Han Solo's wife, or pretend wife, uh, Sena Solo, or Sena Staros, as she's now called, have teamed up. To keep Darth Vader's right-hand woman, Dr. Aphra, uh, imprisoned in this secret prison that's next to this giant star. And Vader really wants her back, wants Dr. Aphra back. And he has set out a group of bounty hunters to kind of break her out of prison. And we get to see, you know, Princess Leia teaming up here with Sena Staros. So that should be interesting, uh, because earlier on in the series, when they first met, it was some rocky road between those two. You know, they really weren't getting along that well because of uh, the nerf herder Han Solo, the scoundrel, the super scoundrel. So that's Star Wars number 17. And we have Obi-Wan and Anakin. Number three, I have mixed feelings about this. Uh, it's kind of like Obi-Wan and Anakin have uh, are visiting this planet where there's a feud going on between two races of people. They're caught in the middle, kind of trying to play peacekeeper. These people are kind of indescript. You know, they're humans. I was kind of disappointed in that. I guess I get spoiled reading stuff like Green Lantern or Aquaman, and you're always kind of introduced to these new species or of characters or beings so to kind of just see like normal human type characters was a bit of a letdown and then also it kind of explores the relationship between uh palpatine you know the guy that went on to become the emperor and anakin and how he was corrupting anakin's mind but i'm a bit mixed about that uh because I felt like, you know, that that was pretty well established, right, in episodes one through three. So I don't know, you know, how much more do you really got to delve into that. But, you know, I'm kind of doing somewhat of a completionist run on all these Star Wars books, and um, I don't know, I'm just compelled to buy it. Luckily, the offshoot miniseries with Star Wars, you know, such as Chewbacca, Lando, uh, this series, they're usually... Well, they actually, they've all been about five issues, so I'm already on issue three, so there's no turning back now. 
So, I don't know. I'm not really going to recommend it, man. I'm not feeling it. But, you know, for sake of being a completionist, uh, I'm continuing with the run. All right. We got some image books. I got three of them. We got Outcast, buddy. One of my favorite image books. One of my most disappointing books because it's too short. And I'm able to read through this shit in like three minutes. It's not like a Carly Quinn book. Where it takes about 20. You know, that's the one thing I got to give Calmer and Palmetti props is that they give you a lot of shit to read. This usually just goes by so quick. Kyle Barnes got into a heap of shit last issue. He's the outcast, he's the main exorcist. He tried to go into an exorcist alone without the help of Reverend Anderson. And the guy that he went to try to exercise just completely fucked him up. He was this big, big dude, a mountain of a man, and possessed at that. So he got the shit kicked out of him. So I guess it raises the question, how much of Kyle Barnes' power relies on you know the synergy with Reverend Anderson, or at least having the presence of someone who has unshakable faith in God? Because Kyle Barnes, even though he is doing all this stuff, really seems almost, I don't know, agnostic, which I'm surprised at. Um, it's a great book. This is written by Robert Kirkman. If you don't know who he is, he's the guy that created Walking Dead. So, you know, strong characterization. Uh, also in this issue, a uh, guy, I forget who it was, if it was his sister. I think, yeah, Kyle Barnes' sister, okay, was possessed. And ended up throwing her husband out the window. And now she is starting to have, uh, you know, she's starting to come to grips with doing that. So, mind fuck city. I can't wait to see how uh, that's going to play out and what kind of guilt she's going to feel. And, of course, we still have the mysterious man in the hat. Now he's taking it off a bit more often who we believe is the devil himself. And he's lurking around town, and it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. All right, speaking of the devil and Satan, this series was on hiatus. This is the start of the second arc of Brian Busoletto and Tony Infante doing the artwork. Look at this dude, David Koresh style, with all his children. Sons of the Devil, number six. Now, this is an interesting book. I'm going to read you the beginning here because they do a much better job when they summarize it, right? I'm not a writer. So Travis Crow is a blue-collar mechanic whose rough childhood was spent in foster care. He struggles with fear of abandonment and has anger issues until a chance meeting, a chance meeting, leads him to his half-sister Jennifer and the realization that he has eight siblings. Now, the funny thing is he met his half-sister at the angry management group, the anger management group that he was mandated by court to go to. And the other funny thing about that anger management meeting, that group, is that the therapist running that group has connections to the satanic cult that Travis's family is a part of. Okay. Anyway. He has the realization that he has eight siblings, all fathered by an 80s cult leader named David Daly. Now, if you know anything about the 80s, one of the big scares during the 80s was the rise of satanic cults, which really turned out to be false. It was all this hype and hysteria. People were writing books and whatnot about it, saying that there were satanic rituals all over the place, kids sacrificing babies, blah, blah, blah. Kids listening to Slayer, becoming possessed and whatnot. Ridiculous. Hysteria. Unproven, unfounded. Okay. Travis doesn't know it, but David made a deal with the devil to sacrifice his children. Not only is he still alive, but he is determined to finish the devil's work that he started 25 years ago. All unbeknownst to Travis, Jennifer is covertly working with David to assemble all of the siblings for the sacrifice. So, yeah. Pretty deep, pretty heavy. And if you read the first arc, you know, you start to see like, oh, this is just so convenient how Jennifer shows up in Travis's life, right? It's just too good to be true. At the end of book one, Travis learns that his living girlfriend, Melissa, is pregnant and was keeping that information from him. With his relationship in jeopardy and a commitment to help Jennifer unite their family, 
Book two begins with Travis at a crossroads. Gritty, gritty drawing by Tony Infante really adds to the character of this book. Brian Buzzoletto, he's an award winner. He writes good dialogue. Uh, the pacing is always good. It's thrilling. It's exciting. Here's the uh, evil therapist that I was telling you guys about, the group leader there. Uh, pretty cool book, man. I highly recommend it, guys. And if you can, pick up the trade. You could probably order it online for like five bucks, I bet. All right. Joshua Williamson, Birthright, High Fantasy. The family is about to get together. Remember, Mikey went missing when he was a year old, and he returned back. A year old. No, I think he was about four or five years old. He was missing for a year, and then he came back as a hulking brute, a la Conan the Barbarian. There's Mikey there. Uh, this is a pretty cool book as well. Um, it's kind of like the blending of two worlds. Where Mikey ended up, he was in this world named Torinos. Gateways have opened up between Torinos and Earth. Uh, in the last issue, last couple of issues, Mikey got the shit beat out of him, like badly, by this warrior named Samuel. And we learn in this issue that Samuel uh, has connections to this family, uh, who's about to be reunited which is interesting. You know, the father has kind of been on his own quest. The mother has been on her own quest. This is a cool story where there's kind of cool creatures. There's cool world building. You know, Williamson keeps dripping details of Torinos as Torinos and Earth become more intertwined. There's cops that have connections with Torinos that want to capture Mikey and use his parents as a lure. So it's cool. It's a cool book, and I really enjoy it. And if you like high fantasy, you got to like Birthright, people. All right? And then finally, we have Hellboy and the BPRD, number 53, Beyond the Fences. This is Hellboy in 1950s suburbia when Eisenhower was president. The silent generation. Don't knock Eisenhower. A lot of people are like, hey, man, what did Eisenhower ever do? That interstate highway in the United States of America was built by Eisenhower, you jerk. Okay. Hellboy is hot on the pursuit of this dog creature that keeps growing, keeps getting bigger. Uh, there's like this geeky scientist guy who has this certain element, like a mineral, and it has some kind of connection to all this. We don't know yet. Here's Hellboy doing battle with the monster. I want to give a big props out to the artist of this series, Paulo Rivera. Uh, just doing a tremendous job. I'm not sure if he's ever worked on any Hellboy stuff before. But he does draw a great Hellboy. Um, it's kind of tropey, you know, kind of monster... I don't know, what do you want to call it, like Monster of the Week kind of movie, or kind of takes the themes, I guess, of the 50s monster movies, right? Um, but Hellboy is always an enjoyable read. I highly recommend it. I'm glad that some of you guys are, you know, that are watching are getting turned on to Hellboy or the BPRD because of my endorsement of it, and uh, I'm glad that you're really appreciating it. And again... Hellboy, Magnoliaverse stuff, BPRD is awesome. And just look at that picture, man, of Hellboy about to go into the barn. It's just like, what the fuck do you think is in there, right? I mean, I'm just loving the artwork, man. Dave Stewart on the coloring, as always. And give it a whirl, man. Give it a whirl. Because look, this thing just keeps growing, people. Keeps growing and molting like a snake, people. All right, that's it, dudes. I've been trying to do these a little bit faster. Let's pick a cover of the week. Again, uh, nothing too special, really. It's a toss-up between Batman and Harley. I got to go with Harley, man. I'm just feeling Harley so much, and I do like the new look. I'm still, I don't know if I'm going to see Suicide Squad or not, but I'm feeling that bomb pop hair, man. It's looking pretty hot, and Harley is a beast. In a good way. All right, guys. Have a good week. Peace.
Bye.